There are two types of universities. We have public universities and we also have private universities and colleges. And although they are all universities and colleges, they may adopt uh, different accounting standards. Okay, for public universities and colleges, they are subject to the GASB reporting standards. Examples: We have University of Houston, is a public university in these areas. This is because the main source of revenues are state appropriations and the grants, in addition to tuitions. In fact, we have more private universities and colleges uh, nationwide. And uh, these private universities and colleges, they are not for profit. They are subject to the FASB reporting standards. Right? Rice Universities is well known private universities here in Houston. And the uh, main source of revenues are student tuitions, investment, and fees. And in, in recent years, there's a, uh, the, the difference between these two are a kind of ambiguous for some institutions. For example, some public universities, especially some of their programs, if they are public universities, they're subject to tuition, you know, regulations. Okay, you cannot charge too much, basically. But, for example, the UCLA, as a business school, especially the MBA program, they won't charge more, but they're public universities. So what they what they did is they opt out. Okay, so for that program, they opt out and become a private program. The to do that, they have to give up a lot of uh, state state and the government appropriations. But as a return, they can charge more, uh, and they get the fund from the a lot of uh, investment and private donations. So far, so good. They 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 have enough money to cover their expenses. All right. So let's talk about standards, accounting standards for public colleges and universities first. Public colleges and universities have much in common with their non-for-profit uh, counterparts. So comparability is, is desirable. Although they adopt different accounting standards, but they're comparable basically. And later you're going to see that it's not too much difference between the uh, financial reports. And most uh, college universities have used AICP reporting models, uh, but some institutions uh, use standard governmental model, okay, which is very different. College universities differ from other governments, right? That's for sure. In how they are funded and managed. First, the school does not have a, does not budget by fund. Okay, therefore, fund accounting is sometimes undesirable, although it's still used. Uh, and uh, according to Gatsby statement number thirty-four, public universities may report as special purpose entities engaged. In only in business type activities, or only in government activities, or in both, they have the option to to choose to be one of these. Uh, and most universities they choose uh, to be this one, only in business type of uh, activities. By choosing this, uh, the college universities can significantly simplify their. Uh, financial reporting, and their financial reporting now looks like uh, a business entities, just like the uh, uh, 
the uh, proprietary fund accounting very similar to business accounting so fund accounting is used for internal purpose only and uh, the fund structure prescribed by, by AICPA is 1973 audit accounting guide for colleges and universities although it's no longer authoritative for external reporting purposes but many universities still use it for as a guidance for the fund reporting so just like the uh, uh, any government agencies uh, uh, universities universities rec can record uh, uh, internally us using fund the current funds loan funds, endowment and similar funds, annuities, life income funds, plan funds, agency funds. Okay? Again, these are for internal purpose only. External for external reporting purposes. Okay. Once they are uh, they, 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 they choose to be a special purpose government entity that engage that engages in business type activities only under GASB 34 then uh, they're going to report the three statement okay very similar to the to, to the proprietary fund the enterprise fund the enterprise fund you have the uh, statement of net assets, okay, and uh, this will be further uh, the net net assets will be further classified into unrestricted, restricted, and investment in capital assets, net of related debt. Then it is uh, the statement revenues, expenses, and change in net assets, which shows the uh, uh, revenues and expenses, and uh, together with the change in change in this uh, net asset. And finally, the statement cash flows. Okay, and remember when we talk about proprietary fund the statement cash flows, very similar to the business, uh, the FASB statement cash flow, but it has four items. Okay, four items. We're gonna see, see it again pretty soon. All right, so this is our example. Uh, this is the University of Houston system combined statement net position. Uh, Let's take a quick look. Uh, we have seen the net, net position in the for their governmental, uh, especially their enterprise fund. Right. We start with asset, uh, which is listed by current asset, right, and non-current asset, and uh, followed by the deferred, deferred outflow of resources. Okay, this is not an asset, but reported together with asset. Deferred outflow of resources. Okay, basically th these are the. I uh, think this is a diff. Uh, the, the the something like a prepaid expenses or right something like that. Right, loss on bond refundings, pensions, and other post employment benefits. Basically the expenses will be recognized right in later period and uh, for those assets liabilities are very similar to other um, government government fund we have cash we have uh, receivables some inventories Right. For long-term assets, again for receivables, 
investment. It could be largest assets, the investment, some capital assets. Okay. So what are those liabilities? Again, for current liabilities, a house of long-term liabilities. The university has issued revenue bound, okay, large amount of revenue bound, and uh, and followed just below liability, we have the deferred inflow resources, deferred inflow resources, right? Those are earned earned benefit basically, earned benefit, and the difference between assets plus the. Uh, Deferred outflow, uh, deferred, deferred outflows, and liabilities plus the uh, deferred inflows equals the net position. The net position, right? As you can see, the net position is categorized into basically three: the invested in capital assets, net of related debt, and restricted net, restrict net position. Then the uh, Unrestricted net position. Okay, among restrict net positions, it also listed the specific restrictions. Right, restrict for debt retirement for capital project. Um, for uh, and and uh, held for permanent investment. Right. Right. So so basically, this is a uh, the statement net position. So next is the uh, University of Houston system, the uh, change in net position, basically the income statement, right? So start with revenues. Okay, to be more specific, it's operating revenues. Okay, as you can see, for uh, for the public universities, typically the change in net positions. Uh, does differentiate between the operating and the non-operating part. First, we have operating revenues and operating expenses, and followed by non-operating revenues and expenses. So, what are those uh, operating revenues? We can take a quick look, right? Um, starting with the tuition fees pledged, right? And have the discount allowances deducted. Auxiliary enterprise pledged. These are the uh, uh, the business University of Houston is doing. Or it could be uh, their uh, like a uh, uh, bookstore. Yeah, could be one of the auxiliary enterprise right revenues. So in addition to those tuitions and uh, fees, we have also uh, right the federal revenue operating. This is a grants from federal, right? Federal pass through revenues, state grants, state grants pass throughs, and uh, and other grants, other grants. So to be more specific, these grants are for operating purposes. Okay, for operating purposes. Uh, what about operating expenses? Right. Look, we look at these operating expenses. They are reported by functions and programs, basically. Right. Instruction could be the largest expenses, operating expenses, followed by research. Academic support, right? All kinds of these are operating expenses. Then operating revenues less operating expenses equals the total op uh, the operating income. Okay. See, it's a loss, right? It's typically for most of the public universities. Uh, that will be a loss. Then we will have the uh, non-operating revenues. 
especially those. Legislative revenues and appropriations are typically used to cover the loss. Okay, so therefore they are not operating revenues. Legislative appropriations. They are used to cover the loss, cover the expenses. So they are not operating revenues. Uh, so these are typically non-operating. Is used to cover the loss, and also uh, donations or gifts also are non-operatings. Okay, and also have some interest income, right? Interest income expenses that yeah, not non-operating, non-operating. All right, so operating income plus the total non-operating revenues equals income before other revenues, expenses, gains, losses, and transfers. Again, uh, there's a, it's a, it's a, right, it's a loss. It's a loss. A system-wide $50 million loss for fiscal year 2019. Uh, right, I guess this number will be even larger this year. Then uh, we also report other revenues, expenses, again, losses, transfers. Uh, right, as you can see, the largest could be the capital appropriations from HEAF, which is a, a high education assistance fund. Right, this is a, a statewide. Uh, uh, fund appropriations, which will be uh, appropriate annually from the state of Texas. Um, and then we have the change in net positions. Uh, because of these, you know, uh, appropriations, so the change in net positions is, turns to positive. So, uh, right. So basically, this is the uh, the, the change in net position. And we're gonna see these uh, later on uh, for details. And also, if the University of Houston, University of Houston, also report uh, the uh, operating expenses in. The two uh, two way matrix. So horizontally, this is a, uh, a function by function reportings, and they also uh, vertically they expand the uh, matrix to the uh, to the object or by their nature. Cost of sold, salary wages. So as you can see, we see more details about the operating expenses okay then uh, this one is the uh, combined statement of cash flows so cash flows are categorized into four cash flows by operating activities cash flows by uh, non-capital financing activities and then by capital and uh, related financing activities, and finally by investing activities. Okay. And this follows the uh, cash flow statement for enterprise fund. Okay. So we can always go back to review the cash flow statement for enterprise fund. Basically, what's different is the uh, between this one and the business cash flow statement is uh, right for financial activities. Now we have the uh, capital related and non-capital related. And this is a uh, right in this is a uh,
This is one way to present cash flow statement, right? And also we have the, uh, they can show the reconciliation between the uh, operating income to, to net cash, right? This is a uh, indirect, this is a direct method. So the indirect method is this tissue as a reconciliation. This is also part of the uh, cash flow statement. And finally, basically, we show the net cash, right, increase or decrease. And uh, you can you can take a look at this cash flow statement again. Okay, I think. There is a place that I'm I'm not gonna agree with, okay. Uh maybe I'm wrong, but you can take a look at uh right, this part, right? The cash flow by Uh, maybe this part. Okay, forget about it. I locked at the wrong, uh, wrong items. Okay. All right. So. So we have reviewed the individual Houston financial reports quickly. Then let's talk about the standards for private college universities like uh, the Rice University. And then we're going to follow the FASB rules, uh, especially the 116 and 117. Again, the three financial statements, the statement of financial positions, statement activities, and then the statement of cash flows. And uh, there are a few differences for the statement of financial positions. Okay, uh, basically the difference is now the net position or net assets is uh, categorized into restricted and uh, unrestricted net assets. And uh, we also have a few differences in the statement activities and uh, in cash flows. Then we're going to talk about that in the in the next few slides. First, we have the Rice University, the financial position, the assets, liabilities, and uh, net assets which is equity okay so this follows the FASB rules so we don't have the uh, so uh, the, the deferred right the deferred inflow and deferred outflows those are not here basically they are become prepaid and unearned right component then the, the the another difference is we we talk about that is the net assets now is reported, right? Two categories basically, with donor restrictions and uh, without donor restrictions, right? And uh, for net assets, with and without donor restrictions, right? Can further report more details. For example, the without donor restrictions, we have internally designated. Internally designated, they're restricted internally, but it's not by donors, so it's it's without donor restrictions. And restricted by donor, this is uh, waste donor restrictions. We have the uh, new investment plans, including both the waste and without donor restrictions. 
in dormant and uh, designated for long-term investment, both with donor without donor restrictions. Life in contrast mostly are with donor restrictions. And student loans and all the other assets, and the majority of them are with donor restrictions. Next is the uh, statement of activities. Basically, it is a change of net, net net assets, right, or income statement. So, again, Rice University, Rice University is also differentiate between operating and uh, non-operating. Okay. Uh, So start with the uh, allocation of endowment spending. Okay, this is the largest uh, revenues, largest revenues. Course tuitions is also the main part of their revenues, and grants. And salary and wages could be the largest expenses for Rice universities. Okay, and we don't see much research expenses. Right. And the non-operating, non-operating uh, revenue expenses. We have gifts, grants, investment returns and other expenses then we have the change net assets right again this is a report separately for uh, waste on restrictions and without on restrictions right this is required for not for profit then we have the cash flow statement this is a typical the three Categories cash flow statement from operating, investing, and the financing activities. Okay. All right. So we have seen both the financial reports for public and private universities. And then let's talk about some of the details. Okay. Or the places we have to pay attention to. First, uh, overall, they, those financial statements look very similar. Okay, so they are very comparable. But there are some differences we have to pay attention to. So let's talk about revenue classification. Both governmental and <coughs> and private universities classify revenues by by source. So we have seen these revenue source already. Typically there are tuitions and fees and various levels of grants, gifts, endowment income, right? Revenues from auxiliary enterprises, which is also part of the operating revenues. And uh, and other things, right? Governmental operations are usually non-operating. They used to cover uh, the expenses, right? And gains and losses. On self-investment, they are non-operating. Then we have the uh, the statement of net position, right? The statement net positions are presented differently for private and public universities, so you should understand the differences and how we're going to report those net assets in different institutions. 
So here we have an example. How to recast the fund balances for Brown University, which is a private university. Assume that planned funds, other than the net investment in plant, are donor restricted. So first we see this is a private university. So it's going to follow the FASB rule. And if we follow the FASB rule, right, we're going to report net assets in two categories. Unrestricted and restricted. So let's see how we're going to recast the fund balances. Now this is a uh, Brown University balance sheet presented by funds. Current funds, loan funds, endowment, and plant funds. Okay, and these are their uh, net assets. So let's see which one is unrestricted, which one is restricted. Okay. First, it's current out the current funds. Twenty million dollars. Right. This is designated, but designated means it's. The restriction posted internally, so it's not by donors. So this 20 million will be reported, right, unrestricted or without donor restrictions, net assets. Okay, this is one. We can do some uh, marks. Right, this is unrestricted, right? And current funds restricted. That's for sure, that's restricted, with donor restrictions. And we have student loans funds established by gift and grants. Okay, these funds are used to give student loans, so they are restricted. So we have their Net assets with donor restrictions. Then we have the endowment, quasi endowment funds. Okay, quasi endowment funds are uh, this is not fully restricted by donors. Usually, we're going to categorize these as unrestricted. Then the next two is our. The next three actually the restricted endowment funds and other endowment funds and live income funds are all restricted by donors. And we have the plan funds, right? It's given by the qu by the question assumed plan funds are all donor restricted except for their uh, net investment in plan. Okay. So this unspendable, it's restricted by donors. All right, this is also restricted by donors. And the net investment plan, this is unrestricted. Okay, so we have totaling three unrestricted net assets. If you add them together, going to report it unrestricted net assets. Then other are restricted by donors. Okay, by doing this, we recast the net assets for the for their uh, statement net positions for this private university. All right, so let's talk about uh, operating expenses. As you can see in both the University of Houston and Rice, Expenses are reported by the functions like education, research, administration, depreciation, okay, and they're recognized on the crew basis, right? The crew basis. And sometimes we can present, right, especially for University of Houston, which is a public university, they report with matrix, right? between the functions and uh, the object classes or nature of the expenses. 
This is because college and universities reporting under GASB, okay, are required to do that. They are required to report uh, the breakdown of expenses in details, in details. And we don't we don't see that for rice, right? Which is not subject to GASB, but it's reported under FASB. Right, so let's talk about uh, specific revenues to see what's a uh, different accounting treatment. First, tuition revenues. Tuition revenues are reported a net of tuition discount and scholarships. Right, for both public and private, right, it's reported net of tuition discount and scholarships, but there are a little bit different for public universities we can see for a UH okay we do see allowance account scholarship allowance also difference between the state tuitions and the actual amount billed to the student we do see the allowance account and discount right under the tuition revenues account and for private universities which who is using the FASB rules, tuition revenues are shown net of any estimated uncollectible amounts. So we just see the net net tuition revenues. Okay? Any unestimated uncollectible amount will be directly deducted. Okay? So you only report net revenues. That's a difference. And for for private universities, right? If the tuition reductions is an employee benefit, right? For example, a UH employee can take classes, and because of that, have some uh, allowances or discount, or their university can pay all her or his tuitions, and those are. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it's it's for. Uh, and and for the, pop uh, public universities, it's not a it's not a problem because that's part of the allowances, but for private universities, okay, we have to be careful, okay. This part of the deductions cannot be subtracted directly from the revenues okay because this part of the deductions will be reported as a compensation expenses okay as a compensation expenses this is for private universities scholarships that do not require services to the universities or colleges are allowances and are treated as reductions in revenues okay this is for private universities only Next question is when do college universities recognize tuition revenues? When they send a bill, when the students pay, right? So for private universities, basically we follow the FASB revenue recognition rules. Tuition revenue should be recognized over the semester as it fulfills its contract with students. Okay, if you fulfill the most of the, oblig uh, the obligations, of the contract, they recognize revenues. And for public universities, rather right, GASB implementation guide says explicitly that tuition and fees for academic semesters that encompasses two fiscal years must be allocated between the two years. All right, let's see one example uh, to see what's the difference between the treatment for private and public universities. 
So we have the fiscal year of college ends July the 31st. In June, a college, a, a, a college collects 120 million in tuition and fees for its summer semester. Okay, that must be a very expensive college, right? For its summer semester that begins on June 1st and ends on August 15th. As you can see, this summer semester, right, goes across two fiscal year, right? Because the fiscal year ends July 31st. This across two fiscal year. It also collects 180 million for the following four semester, which begins on September 5th. Faculty salaries applicable to summer sessions are $10 million. Of that amount, $8 million are applicable to June and July and $2 million to August. These are uh, salaries for summer courses. All right, so let's see how we're going to record these transactions. First, let's see a private university who adopts the FASB rule. Okay. So we're going to follow the SCP guidance. The entire summer semester tuitions and fees, as well as the related faculty salaries, should be recognized in the year ending July the 31st, 2017. It's because uh, the, most of the summer semesters are, has, have been covered, has been covered by the fiscal year 2017 and the obligations are fulfilled. We can, we can, we can assume all the obligations are fulfilled. So to record revenues for summer semesters, debit cash and credit revenue from tuition fees, all of them, and also their faculty salaries are all reported because the obligation is, is fulfilled. Debit salary uh, expenses, credit cash, and credit, right? Uh, the payables, right? Deferred faculty salaries, payables. So this is the FASB rule. So if we are uh, public companies, okay, we follow GASB. And for GASB, it's, it's very specific that uh, the $120 million for summer semester should be allocated to two fiscal years. Okay, and to be more specific, by you can allocate that by days. So if you do the calculation, the so summer semesters are two and a half months, which approximately 75 days, right? Among the 75 days, 60 days belongs to the last fiscal year, and 15 days belongs to the next fiscal year. So the $120 million will be allocated uh, by that ratio. So we credit revenue from tuitions, $96 million, right, which is uh, 60 over 75. Then uh, another 24 is deferred revenues, okay, deferred revenues from tuition fees, okay, and we see where to report deferred revenues under GASB, right? And again, the faculty salaries also will be divided between two uh, fiscal years. So for the last fiscal year, that will be $8 million. Okay. And uh, the, for the next fiscal year in August, when we pay another $2 million, that will be reported as an expense for the next fiscal year. Okay, that's the difference. between the public and private universities for tuition recognition.
And again, also we collect one hundred million dollar, one hundred eighty million dollars tuitions for the next four semester. Okay. So under both Fasby and Gatsby, uh, this will be a right. This will be a revenue for the next fiscal year, two thousand eighteen fiscal year. So we debit cash and the credit revenue received in advance, which become a liability for this is a for if it's a liability, right? It's a public or private university. If it's a liability, think about it. Right? If it's a liability, right, we're gonna follow the FASB rule. So it's a private university. If it's a public universities, we're gonna follow the GASB. Then what is this? Right? This becomes a a deferred deferred inflow, right? Deferred inflow. Okay. Next let's talk about the grants. Grants can be exchange transactions, okay? So one party, uh, the grantor receives direct benefits in the form of something of value in exchange for the grant. For example, university tests the product under federal contract, but the government retains a patent to use the product. So in this case, it's an exchange, right? The university receives money and need to give up the patent to the government. So many college and university treat research grants as exchange transactions because the grantor expect performance and a report on how the funds were were used. If it's an exchange, okay, before you turn out your final products, right, you haven't fulfilled your obligation yet. So you cannot recognize the revenue if it's an exchange. In these cases, restrict funds not yet spent are considered deferred revenue. Deferred revenue. Okay? Or for uh, public universities, that's uh, the, uh, the deferred, deferred inflow, right? Deferred inflow. And if we have a uh, in non-exchange transactions, okay, if we receive grants, these gifts are considered increased to temporarily restrict net assets for private universities and uh, a restrict net assets in public universities. So in both universities, right, that's we that will be restricted, right, restricted uh, net assets. And can be recognized immediately as revenues. So let's see examples. So a private university's accounting department received 300,000 federal grants to carry out research in government budgeting. Of this amount, 180 million or 180,000 was to cover faculty salaries and uh, 120,000 was to cover overhead. So this is a research grant but that work for the government, right? So we can treat this as exchange. During 2017 the department began research and paid faculty members forty-five thousand. It was reimbursed by the federal government for seventy-five thousand. So work is under progress. So first we record the f the salary expenses. And because we fulfill fulfilled part of the obligations, right? We're gonna recognize. Seventy-five thousand dollars revenues, so 
So we debit due from federal government with receivables and credit government grants and contract $75,000. And to record the collection of cash from the federal government, debit cash and credit due from federal government. Okay. So how about the uh, the rest of the grant? Okay, they are not revenue yet. Okay, they are not revenue yet. We have to fulfill, finish the research, then we can uh, record the rest of revenue. Student loans. Student loans will be recorded just like ordinary loans. So if we, we have the student loans to become student loans receivables, and if we receive payback from the students, we debit cash and credit loan receivables and uh, credit interest revenue. Okay, interest revenue. Related entities. College universities may have institutionally related foundations for fundraising, alumni re relations, or uh, management of assets. And how to report those related entities? Okay, they can either be disclosed in the notes to financial statements, or they can be reported as component units, depending on the degree of controls and economic interest. Okay, so we can go back to review what are those. Uh, controls and economic requirements for component entity reporting. So basically, uh, for the GASB, they require public universities to report affiliated organizations as component units if these criteria are met. Right? First, economic resources received or held are almost entirely for the direct benefit of the universities. Universities entitled to assess those resources and economic resources are significant to the university. Okay, if we satisfy these, it's a component unit. And this script presentation is required. Okay. Just like uh, any other government agencies or non-for-profit organizations, colleges and universities, their performance can be evaluated. They can be evaluated with the traditional analytical tools. Right? However, colleges and universities are also different from those entities. So the analysis need also need to look to factors that are are uh, far afield from those associated with corporate financial ana analysis. For example, financial performance is only part a small part of the uh, evaluation, but we also need to look at other things like admissions, right? Uh, like faculty uh, performance and and uh, other things that are non financial, non financial ratios. The fiscal health of college universities, okay, uh, is important. Both government and private is sensitive to unfavorable national economic conditions. So you can see for 2020, the the performance right will be bad for most of the universities. Right, this is a pretty much for this lecture.